it's still too low. And Ada looks hot as shit in that turtleneck. I'm just saying, man. Oh my! I'm Company? Saying. How on earth did you get in here? Oh, please don't fret. I have no intention of making a meal of you. Bro, I please can see the occlusion mapping the on the Duke. fucking corners of the screen when you turn the camera. That's how you know it's real time. The veil of goods to lords and ladies, prophets, and priestesses. I do so strive to please my patrons. I hope we can become well acquainted. But of course it is not I who is on display here, but rather the wares on offer for you. I deal in all manner of commerce. Uh, today, so every time I start this, I people go full screen, and I'm like, okay, is this the full screen this that you want, where it cuts off the vast majority of the image? Of is that what you would prefer? Gathered from all throughout the realms Somehow of I doubt it. The more hard won the knowledge, the higher the price. But you look like you're well aware of the value of such things. Well, since we're here, I've got a few morsels I'd love to share with such a connoisseur. Please. I actually really like it having Take the, the name down here. The other thing is that, uh, by the I've noticed on the React streams of my new layout, um, having this be a little smaller actually helps the bitrate of whatever I'm playing or watching uh, immensely. Happy Close half captioning. Birthday, Rose. Oh, German, good. Good, uh, excellent. I just want to find my daughter. I'll always be there for you, no matter what. They should give, they should give fucking Ethan Brownhouse kicks. That's what they should do. You are my precious rose. And I didn't care. So long as we were together. I'm so sorry. The baby's huge. I love you. Yeah, you can't have that character walking around in the other games with mold powers. They can't do that. You can't have that. I'm Kento Kinoshita, the director of the Winter's Expansion. Ethan gave his life to protect Rose. And in the end, you see how she's grown. What kind of person is 16-year-old Rose? That's what we wanted to explore, so we decided to have her at that age in this expansion. You said you had something important to tell me? She's trying to get rid of her unwanted powers, but to do that, she is forced she to return to, to the origin of her misfortune. She's like head to toe bioweapon. We thought that concept had a lot of potential for an interesting story. So the setting this time is the realm of consciousness, going back one more time to that village. 
The word nightmare is synonymous with fear. And For horses. instance, if you've ever had a childhood fever that caused a nightmare, even if they only last for an instant, like the feeling of being attacked by a giant doll or something else similarly so completely unrealistic, can remain as a fragment of a memory for the rest of your life. I wanted the core of the feeling of fear to come from the kind of memories and nightmares that still haunt people to this day. We wanted to choose characters that would interest people who didn't play the mercenaries mode, but would be interested in playing a different type of character. Oh, you mean like the two coolest characters in the entire game? There are characters called lords, and playing is the is that, is that how you made that decision? amazing skills and attacks that a regular human could not. Being able to play them was more fun, <laughs> so that's why we chose those They're characters. They're obviously the two char coolest characters in the whole game. We balance things to ensure that as little time as possible was spent waiting for enemies to appear. For instance, if a player doesn't finish off an enemy, it will chase after the player. We made adjustments like this to raise the tempo and increase the fun of defeating enemy after enemy. No, don't play as In the an fish, FPS, dude. you experience the game world as if it's through your own eyes. So it can be incredibly scary to play a horror game from that perspective. There are some players out there who might find it too scary or experience motion sickness in the first person perspective. Ah, oh, it's too they scary. They might not enjoy the FCS genre. So we wanted to make a third person mode for those players to enjoy the game to its fullest. While there's still a sense of immersion and fear with a third-person perspective, when the player character dies, it doesn't feel as much like you yourself are dying. And you can enjoy playing it as a game to confront the fear that it creates, which is a very different experience. I think so third literally person just said is a some people like third people person to return so you put to third Resident person Village in there. as both a game and an experience. Wouldn't it be okay to show Ethan's face? We gave that question some thought. So even in third-person mode, if you try to turn the camera to see his face, Ethan will look away, and you're not quite able to get a good look. No, oh, you'll manage. Each of the three editions are interesting in their own way, and we hope you really enjoy the expansion. Please look forward to it. I will, thank, thank you. you. I plan on enjoying it very much. Now we have an amazing announcement for you. Oh my God. Starting today, a demo for the third person mode will be available. Here is the release date and platforms for the demo. Oh my God, I fucking the hate demo. the way they do these demos. I'm this not demo even going can be played for a total of 60 minutes I'm not in third person mode or the previously existing first person mode. Hello everyone, I'm the producer of Resident Evil 4, Yoshiaki Hirabayashi. I'm here today to deliver the newest information about the title. First, please enjoy this new gameplay footage. Okay, I will, thank you. Let's do a fucking suplex or roundhouse kick. Wow, he looks so much like Hookman Leon. Even holds his uh, flashlight the same way.
This. this is actually a much more dire start. It's also uh, a reference to how he meets the zombie in the police uh, in the gas station already too. No fucking way. Okay. Already we see a knife icon for a defensive weapon. Uh, and we're being shown the parasite instantly because we all know. Under one. Hunnigan here. What's your sit rep? President's daughter, Baby Eagle. Good it's old Baby Eagle. Village. Our intel was correct then. Well done. Something's happened to people here. My escorts are. <laughs> Gotta go. Talk later. <laughs> Yay, out the window. All right, so we got stealth. Interesting. Do we have stealth kill? I want a roundhouse kick. Give me, oh yeah! Leon. Get that shoddy. It's right behind you, Leon. Hey! You can knife a guy as a... as like a defense to instant kill. See that button? That's a great solution. Okay, so it took a little bit of knife energy. It took about one-fifth of knife energy. That did not take... Oh, it took a little bit, yeah. Yeah! Oh, man. What did you think? Oh, yeah. As you just saw, we are paying respect to the original game's world. Oh, okay. implementing new ideas and stated the art graphics to strengthen the core concepts. The trip to the Resident title. Evil 5 God Hand is going. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing how each of these games is becoming like if you more play the of original, a fucking that high end action game? And veterans to Resident Evil 4 will enjoy. No the Ganados will have all new ways to attack. They are closing in on Leon during his mission and will attack with an even greater variety of methods than in the original release. Yeah, okay. Leon fights back with firearms, close combat maneuvers, a newly added parry using his knife, and more. Oh, dude, knife, knife moves. And Resource yeah, that was a parry. and upgrade elements are critical for survival. So the parry is hitting Just L1. Just as in the original, using yeah! an attaché case effectively will be key. 
In addition to managing the weapons and items you carry and synthesizing herbs, this also allows you to craft ammunition and other items. Oh. Over here, stranger. Of course, we can't forget the merchant. Something new for you. You can purchase weapons and items and customize them to suit your playstyle. Increase the power of the noise. Where rare gems Did you see that? can be exchanged for special items. <laughs> you can't go wrong with that. That dude sounds like a dragon star. We are rebuilding the original game while respecting its core experience, adding new ideas, and modernizing the playfield. That, I don't know if you guys saw, but the knight, Perry, didn't have a icon pop up. Now I'd like to up. share some new information regarding this product's release. We announced that Resident Evil 4 will also be available on PlayStation 4, in addition to PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X, and Xbox Series S, and PC. The PlayStation 4 version can be upgraded to the PlayStation 5 digital version at no additional cost. I'd like to introduce two other editions we are preparing for players looking for more than the standard edition. The first is the Deluxe Edition, which will be available for all platforms. This includes additional content, such as costumes, this is really special silly weapons, that we're seeing. a treasure map, and more. Next is the Physical-Only Collector's Edition. This edition includes the contents of the Deluxe Edition, as well as a Leon figure, a special map, art book, soundtrack, and more. Also, pre-orders start today. When's it coming out, though? Give me a date. If you pre-order the standard edition, you'll receive the attache case gold and special charm handgun ammo. It's so dirty. They would do that. If you pre-order the deluxe edition or collector's edition, you'll receive the standard edition pre-order bonuses, as well as attache case classic and special charm green herb. It's the worst part about this. Is that I can't if you pre-order pre the digital version on the PlayStation it, Store, sends me a you'll code. receive the code they a send mini soundtrack. You can secure these bonuses by pre-ordering Resident and Evil 4. Correctly. Thank you for watching so far. We are working hard to create a game that everyone will enjoy. I will probably very much enjoy it. So please look forward to it. I am in fact Before looking I go, forward to it. We have one more update for you. Let's take a look. You're here looking for someone? Maybe some missing senorita? Oh my god, Luis looks like such a scumbag. Your soul requires cleansing. Ashley Graham, are you in here? Just let me go. Listen. I'm hearing the president's orders. And... What is that? What do we do? I like the Ashley's new look. We need to go. I'm gonna get you home safe. You can stop right there, Ada. Hey, girl. Who are you? What are you doing here? My show. Oh, it's the boy! Ashley, run! The entire world shall overflow with these grains. What's happening to me? <laughs> now, abandon your body. Leave the girl. She's lost no matter what. Now that he has oh, chosen his hair is so bad now! I love it! Oh, you gotta be kidding me.
Hey, that means fucking Street Fighter's coming out in February. Did you enjoy the Resident Evil showcase? I did. Let's recap. First, Resident Evil Village Gold Edition launches on Guys, Friday, we gotta, October 20th. Hey, how, how close are we to Resident the fiscal Evil year? Village, you could purchase the Winter's uh, the expansion 24th. DLC separately. That gives you like a week, right? Okay, well you have to hit submission. You can't, you can't fail compliance because then you'll miss the fiscal so quarter. Enjoy the main game we'll fucking fight you. The powered up, the mercenaries additional orders, and the God, new story campaign, so Shadows of Rose. Oh, yes. A demo for the third person mode will be available today. In my balls right Don't now. forget. It's real bad. The early access period for Resident Evil R Reverse begins October 24th for all owners of Village. Resident Evil Village Cloud, playable on Nintendo Switch via a cloud but service, watch will be available starting piss. October 28th. Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil 3, and Resident Evil 7 are also coming to Nintendo Switch via cloud at a later date. Also, the Mac version of Resident Evil Village will be released on October 28th. The newest entry in the series, Resident Evil 4, will release on Friday, March 24th, 2023, and you can pre-order it today. I wonder we hope if you I look can forward beat to that it. game in one sitting. Thank you very much for watching. I bet I can. Well, well, looks like you've had your fill. With such a grand display, I should hope so. Oh, I'm afraid I have an appointment I must attend to. Just a bit of bartering with another merchant. An odd chap, but his information is good. And I shouldn't say any more. Anyway, I do hope I'll see you again. I'll strive to prepare a suitably satisfying stock of goods. Well, that was fun. All right, guys, I'm going to be right back. I'm going to take a big old pile of piss at my piss, at my piss hose. So I will be right back. Excuse me. All right. Let's fucking, let's fucking look at shit. Okay, time, to, oh, that's wrong. Let's look at shit. So, so I've been asked about four times today. Hey, Pat, did you see the Vampire Survivors launch trailer? The answer is no. Yeah. Yeah. Vampire Survivor. Just buy it. Oh, hey, Jedward kicked in five subs. Thanks, Jedward. Boy. I'm sorry, Italians are not real, it's true. Everybody knows it. Available now. God, I forgot about this interaction. That's fucking great. You know how they say, waiting for paint to dry? It never dries. No, it does. Is that right? The General Electric Toaster Oven that toasts both sides at once, evenly, okay, so perfectly, and delivers the toast We right need to get a toaster. Automatic. All right, we've got... We so got really I'm fun, actually very interested really in this. Concept. <laughs> right now you're looking at you say type of bakery you're running over here, Lou. Uh, it, it is not a bakery. I want, however, those I want to know if I should get a, a really reason. overpriced that toaster. Right, I, I ordered this. All right. Chainsaw, Once upon a fucking time, relax. The relax most about cake. Expensive, most premium relax. toaster. Relax. It's a whole different concept for how to toast bread. Fucking relax. Bread. And then I said, you know, the only way to really analyze this thing, what could be the world's 
most expensive toaster is to put it up against I've heard about a fancy toaster that it can take pieces of shit toaster. toast and make this it taste like fancy Select toast. Traditions. Toast I just bought this at boost? the Canadian Tire for $13. Up against this one, which on Amazon currently is toast $373. Boost? And in Canadian dollars, it's over 500 bucks. It only Fuck. toasts one slice at a time Fuck. because that's how special it is. So it's the TO-ST. Oh, one man. dash T from Mitsubishi. We're going to do a taste test, myself and Willie do. We have some premium bread from Cobb's Bakery. And we have no, some you want to use the shit bread. bread from the local Sobeys. That's Dempsey's. Yeah, yeah, you want the you Sobeys Dempsey's shit bread. White official with the Canadian flag. First off, we're going to try to figure out if we can tell the difference between the toasters, tell the difference between the breads. And oh, hey, Spritz gifted 10 subs. Thanks, Spritz. Oink, 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 I'm a little piggy man, and I oink as much as their subs make me can. Ta-da. And tell you if there's any need at all for you as a human being to consider the idea of owning, spending, or placing a $400 toaster on your countertop in 2020. And isn't it a beauty? It looks like Christmas, doesn't it? This no, it looks is like a the fucking toaster. Mitsubishi premium toaster. And you know it's premium right away because you crack it open and check the recipe booklet. Ooh. Look at this. It's cinnamon, apples. I can't the key read that to shit. this expensive toasting tech is Ooh. that everything is sealed in. The idea being that it keeps the moisture inside, whereas your typical cheapo toaster is drying out the bread because it's open on the top. It comes well, yeah, it'll with dry the bread tray. out. It's making People the are bread saying, hot. Man, you throw the butter on before you put it in. That's something you could do. People are saying you throw French toast straight into this guy. So we no, have the little can't. spatula. That doesn't this make any like sense. You can't do that. Information. It's all very serious. You could never I feel do that. Like I've purchased an expensive appliance. This is the toaster. Got the nice wood grain on the top. Jack's a big fan of the wood grain right there. Oh, okay, you can tell that's the fancy Quite toaster. A large item for the counter for a toaster for one slice. Jesus. Okay, we remove the protective covering. That's where the bread goes. It goes onto this tray. The whole thing seals up. There's a tremendous number of settings on the front. Regular toast, defrost, defrost I don't know, toast. and French toast. That looks like maybe for stale toast. And then there's different levels for how toasted you want it. Four, five, six, eight. Now they claim to have taken some of their tech from the rice cookers. That, that They obviously manufacture those as well. And those things are all about keeping the moisture inside. You know, when you're talking about food, it often comes back to the moisture, the juiciness. They say that you cook a, a, a succulent meal. Now you may be wondering, Lou, where are the toppings? All you have here is the bread and that's because we want the real analysis. We yeah, want man. to examine the bread and only the bread, the, yeah, the no, crunch and the softness. We want to no, put you want, you our want sensory clean. systems on high alert. Now, let's compare that to the budget unboxing experience, the traditions by Proctor Selects. It's actually not that complicated, this device. There's nothing in the package. It really doesn't need to be. Very lightweight. It's a bit marked up over here. <laughs> You would see this in a, I don't know, a dormitory. You would, maybe you got a really cheap Airbnb. This is what would be in the house. If you can get it, get the job done for 10 bucks. Well, toast the toast. More power to you. But it's not the most satisfying interaction if you're constantly making toast. And of course, there's not many settings. It's just, that's it. First things first, let's start with the standard toaster, just to refresh mm -hmm. what a simple piece I'm of toast I'm aware of how a standard toaster works. Very short cable on the cheap toaster. That is actually- First, it's gonna be the supermarket like bread. Crazy short. In the $10 toaster. Right. Now the beauty is we can do two slices at a time. That is that is actually a, like insanely crazy short that, wait cable. A uh oh. Wait a minute. The bread is too large for the actual... Yeah, the top of it is exposed. <laughs> it's not gonna get an even toast on there. Oh, that's not good. This is a type of toaster. You just need that bread heated up a bit, man. You just need something other than the bread itself. Yeah, you got like five minutes and then you're out the door. Oh, that's, that's it. That's you're gonna way... take that toast, you're gonna move on, and you're not gonna think about it too much. It's sustenance. You're just trying to live. A level six 
this to I would eat this toast. Yeah, this of is course. not too toasted for me. Really? I mean. Okay, yours is a yours is. Yeah, dead. yours is a little. All right, fucked. we're gonna have to do that again, I guess. See, this is the issue as well, with your typical toaster. Consistent toast. And there's bagels. It's different, you know. It's hard, man. Oh, yeah. I miss Montreal okay. bagels. All right, you want to grab yours? Okay. Oh, I miss. So them. definitely, what we thought. Never gonna have them again. No, it's I not. Will, but still. It's not gonna get the top portion now. very well. All right, you ready? Cheers. Yeah. Here we go. Hmm. It's a piece of fucking toast. What the fuck do you expect? It tastes like childhood. It's not bad, but it's not special. Some would say it's a bit dry. Yeah, no <laughs> shit. We're going to shift now to the premium bread in the $10 toaster. Now, what's That's weird is that this waste. bread costs almost as much as the toaster. That's so fucking <laughs> stupid. You're talking about a premium bread from Cobbs, shout out to Cobbs Bread. I Don't. suppose the other thing Let's... we're gonna get to the bottom of with this experiment is not just the the difference from the premium toaster to the cheap toaster, but also the premium bread to the cheap bread and whether or not it's worthwhile to bother upgrading your bread if you're not prepared to upgrade okay, your Okay, I'm telling you right now, you uh, can buy a fucking PlayStation or, instead or of this toaster. It's, it's not save your money on the toaster and just buy better bread. You could bread. buy 30 hookers. Right. That's strange. Look at that. That's for a, this much toaster. less toasted than the supermarket bread. Okay, let's give it a go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> bread is way better. It's crispier. Mm -hmm. The bread is a massive impact. If you just go with a slightly more premium bread, well, yeah, no even shit. on a $10 toaster, it's yeah, a no huge shit. upgrade. Now, that brings us, of course, to the elephant in the room. No fucking shit. The Mitsubishi. And first, we're going to hit it with the supermarket white bread. Now, look at this seal chamber that's created in there. It's amazing. OK, we close it down. Then we're going to give it a start makes a chime. I like the red light and I like the dedicated start stop button. This was a bit nerve wracking on the $10 item. It definitely can't make good bread bad. I mean, good bread is good bread. Good bread is good bread. Yeah. 2020. Oh yeah, get it Jack. Whoa, a little steam outlet on the back. Where's all that moisture coming from? That is a little strange. Oh. Okay. All right, that looks pretty good. I'll, I'll admit. <laughs> that looks like a nice piece of bread. Wow. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> it's so even. It's fluffy. There's a fluff to it that a typical uh, toaster can't. Somebody achieve. in the chat the says, "If you buy this, you're the class trader." Man, what if I bought it for review, man? What if I bought it to fucking? Okay, now obviously the last thing to do you is for us to premium you bread. Don't, you don't know with the premium toaster. Yes, it's the four hundred dollar toaster and the four dollar bakery bread. Now we know what happened on the cheapo toaster. This was a big improvement. And we hope that the same thing happens over here. Mm. How is the bread mm. turning brown then? There is a heating element on the one side, but how is the top of the bread brown? Where's that water coming from? Probably okay, bad. so um, since since the since it's sealed, even though there's a heating element on the bottom, the heat's going to disperse to the to the top. The, the bread it like, uses the bread's own water. Do you guys not know how heat that is works? An incredible amount of steam. Guys, I really feel crazy. I feel like like the some basic physics, chemistry, etc. that I learned like in high school, like twenty years ago, just is just, did, just didn't apply to like people like I, I like it makes me feel nuts oh that looks yummy i want to eat it
So it's better. I'm shocked. That looks like the battle. Pass! That Ooh. shit looks like the battle. Yes. Pass! That looks like Fort, mate. That shit looks like the battle. Pass! That's <laughs> what? I'm telling you, what he say. Fine, it shows me this old man's old rhyme. Oh. Oh. In the state of Kentucky, there is a cave. Yeah. That every now and then demands a sacrifice. January 30th, 1925. A man walks towards the cave with a kerosene lamp in his hand. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to fight all of you. Um, when I started watching videos, there were like 20 people going, when are we going to watch the cave video? When are we going to watch the cave video? Now that we are watching the cave video, there are just as many people going, it's an hour? Oh my god, oh my god, don't watch it! Like, what do you fucking people want? Like, I literally didn't watch this video for fucking three weeks so that I could watch it with you guys like you told me to. Yeah, fuck it. Run a poll. Yeah, okay, fine. So let's run a poll. Fuck it. Let's see what we got. I'm voting in the I'm voting in the poll. Oh man, that is easily the most amount of votes I've ever gotten in a poll ever. Wait, what the fuck? How did 800 people more... Wait, how are more people voting in the fucking poll than... What? No, change that. I don't want a point-spending vote. That's fraud. Do it again. I'm actually like legitimately completely baffled. All like for two, three weeks, people have been asking me if I'm going to fucking watch this video on stream. And as soon as I start to wait, watch it, people start to freak out. Like, le legitimately, completely baffled. Watch at 1.25 speed? Yeah, I don't do that shit for videos that have voices in them. You guys might all be crazy. And, and you, you might, might be great, great watching a video, video that, that sounds like this. Oh my god, wow, oh my god, I can't believe it's that odd oh, jump scare. Ha <laughs> But I'm not. I watch videos like a video. All right, the cave just dominated. We're watching the cave. He hangs up his jacket and ducks into a five foot opening. The inside of the cave is narrow. He has to drop down on his hands and knees 
crawling through a passageway filled with jagged rocks and choking dust. Then down a chute he had cleared out months earlier. All of the daylight is gone from here. Why would man this do this? Lantern is his only source of light. Ignoring the loose limestone rocks perched directly above him, he is now 100 feet in. And here he reaches the turnaround room. Now they call this the turnaround room because this is the juncture where even experienced cavers say, no thanks, and turn around. Oh. Because to continue on means going through this. The squeeze. A gap in the stone of... Hey, hold on. Shark Missile says, please warn people with claustrophobia or anxiety not to watch this video. I'm going to point out that a video called Man in Cave at this point should be very clear that if you're anxious about claustrophobia that you should not watch this. I don't think the content warning is required. I think it's actually incredibly obvious. Only nine inches. For reference, here's a subway sub. Damn, dude. Couldn't even Going fit my through, dick he through would that. look exactly like this. His oh. arms will need to be completely at their side, and he will need to exhale so that he can reduce the oh, size of his that. torso. Gradually, bit by bit, he disappears Why? into the hole. Why would you do that? His clothes are caught on sharp gypsum crystals, hooking into him and threatening to hold him in place. But using his feet like paddles, he pushes through. He reaches a wider opening at the other side, then crawls forward towards a ledge. Illuminated here is a 10-foot drop. Oh, fuck. A rope is already secured around a boulder, which allows him to rappel down. His worn-out leather shoes touch the ground. This is as far as he can go, and it is time for work to begin. What he is working on is another opening. At the moment, it's too small. Oh, I thought that was in the cave. <laughs> Sing a scary cave video. I could. Scary, I thought it was part of the cave. Yeah, right. I thought, I don't know why, I thought that, I thought there was like a, a ghost in the cave. Small for anyone to fit through, but he will chip away at it until he can shove himself right through the other side. Because on the other side is this. A magnificent and otherworldly cave structure that will be irresistible to tourists. Every day for months he has been removing rocks from this crevice. But to tourists him, will have to go through the, is the tiny cave routine. opening and die. So he eases further into the gap. Carefully, he contorts his body through. Rocks compress the sides of his torso so close that his arms are pinned to the side of his body. Oh, I hate He this. once again paddles his feet to oh, inch I hate down. this a lot. Then, about halfway, he stops. Hmm, the lantern. It's starting to dim. He will need to go all the way back to the surface to refuel the thing. He sighs. He slowly shuffles back out, pushing the lantern with his shoulder. Then, oh no. Din, crack, darkness. He has knocked over the lamp, and it has broken. I don't like that. Now the man didn't panic. He had been caught in the dark before, and he could make his way back by feel alone. Okay. So he continues worming out. Well, that's not Leveraging so bad. Leveraging his foot against what he thinks is the cave wall. But that is not the cave wall. That is, in fact, a rock protruding from the ceiling. As soon as he puts his weight against the rock, it breaks loose. A solid piece weighing 15 kilograms lands directly on his ankle. It aches. But he's okay. It doesn't feel as though his ankle is broken. 
Oh, hold up. I just realized the HelloFresh thing is still popping, but it's no longer HelloFresh time, so I have to go delete the HelloFresh pop. Excuse me, chatbot. Timer. I'm sorry, HelloFresh. Goodbye. I loved you. I eagerly await your return. I'm just badly bruised and caught underneath the rock. So he shuffles to move the rock away. Suddenly, gravel. A lot of gravel. It falls onto his feet, his legs, his torso, and the weight of it all forces the wedged rock deeper into the gap underneath his foot. Pinned. He tries to push forward. He cannot. He tries to inch backwards. He cannot. He is stuck. This is Sand Cave. This man is Floyd Collins. He is trapped in absolute darkness. 60 feet deep below the earth, all of his limbs held in place at the very bottom of this. But before Profession. I tell you what happens next, add time. Yeah! Trapped in a cave. World of Tanks. World of Tanks is not only the best game I have ever played, it is the only game I have ever played. It's like cars, but tanks. Yeah. Picture this. You're I have to say, T internet historian has been a real, because a real inspiration to me in my ad campaign family. career. It's time for revenge. You must use strategy. You must use stealth. You must use your wits to defeat your enemies. Use long range or short range. It's available on console, but I want you to get it on PC. Imagine a world war, but there are tanks involved this time. Yeah, now you're good. When you've seen this, I can't Mr. believe people Texas didn't want to watch this. You people are stupid. You people are My stupid God. as fuck. I'm gonna be sick. Look at all the different tanks. I can sit here and watch every internet historian video customize again. Customize them all. Massive battles where you can constantly team kill and ruin other people's good time. What the fuck? I'm on your fuck. Yeah! Did I mention it's historically accurate? Especially the Japanese robot tanks. Ooh, look. The tanks are kissing. Progressive. Use the invite code TANKMANIA and get the Excelsior. 250k credits. Other stuff. Go to the link in the description and use the invite code TANKMANIA. Here's what you do. Give World of Tanks. Put that on one screen. Then, on a second monitor, you watch the next hour of this video while you play the game. Perfection. I'm contractually obliged to say thank you for being a friend. Fuck Sarge, off. No, no. You're not. Tanks empty, kid. Go on without me. No, use your repair consumable. It's too late, kid. Take care of my family for me. No. Get it, 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 get it. Add o Collins is still in the dark, unable to move. His left arm was pinned underneath his torso, his right wedged by the rock ceiling above. Oh, this sucks. Beneath him, sharp crystal shards dug into his skin. Ice thawed, traced across the ceiling, and dripped down directly onto his face, pooling underneath him. The water was a consistent 54 degrees. Floyd tried to breathe calmly in the concentrated dark. When he did attempt to shuffle, more gravel and rocks would tumble from above and pile onto his feet, yeah, you know, so nothing would work. He clawed at the cave walls till his fingertips were bloody, and he realized that there was only one option left. Call out for help. But wait, 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 wait. Who is Floyd, and why did he even go into a dangerous cave? This is a great question. Floyd has been exploring the caves of Kentucky since he was merely six years old. And as he grew up, he gained a reputation for being a very daring caver. He would dive into some. I don't understand on professional spelunkers. Miles away on someone else's property. Sup? He grew up and he became embroiled in the Kentucky cave. Like it feels Wars. like they're just attempting to kill now, themselves. There's way constantly. too much to go into here. But the summary version is: there's this huge network of interconnected caves called Mammoth Caves. It's actually the largest cave system in the world. And there's a city right in the middle of it. Cave City, real name. 
So of course, there are dozens of cave entrances on private property all over the place. Now, farmland in this region has very poor soil and things do not grow well here. So, cave tourism as a source of income quickly became the prominent thing. However, a problem. There are a very large number of caves, right. but there are only a limited number of tourists. So competition rapidly escalated. Visit my cave. No, no, no. Visit my cave. Big signs were erected saying, Ah, oh, tourists, come to me. Ah, oh, mine is definitely my open. Mine cave. is the best. But then competitors would respond by saying, Hey, by the way, we're open, but don't go to that one over there. It's really shitty. In fact, it's dangerous. This kept going further. By the end, they were blocking off the trail to each other's property, beating each other in the streets, and hiring people called cappers who would dress up as policemen and tell tourists, no, 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 you can't go in there. That one, no, it's illegal. Oh, fuck, Despite that's the fierce awesome. the competition, Floyd found a cave on his property and he started advertising it to tourists. Of course, very few came. All right, he thought. What if I found something really special and unique? Then surely people would have to come to my cave to see it. So he kept exploring and exploring until he found this hollow. It was filled with big gypsum crystals. And when you were in there, it felt like a completely alien world. But it was barely accessible. This small tunnel is the only way in. He would need to dig for months to open it up to tourists, but he knew he could do it. Back to the competition. They knew the value of this cave. They knew the potential. They wanted it for themselves, and they wanted Collins gone. One time, five of them just wandered onto Floyd's property and demanded he hand over the lease. When he refused, they just started beating the shit out of him. This only stopped when Floyd's brother, Homer, marched out with a shotgun and chased them all off. But Floyd was not deterred. American business. He spent 12 hours a day, every day, for months, clearing gravel and stone, chipping away at that passage. He would open it up to tourists, make his cave an incredible attraction, and make his dreams come true. But now he's stuck in the hey! fucking cave. Is anyone there? So there's Floyd in the dark, yelling out for help. He's at the start of a very tiring loop. Sleep, wake, hey! yell. Sleep, wake, Hello? yell. Hours passed. His voice gave in. Homer's the only person that could possibly save him, right? Pain radiating up his ankle. Here he remained in the dark for the next 23 hours. Because, like, Homer would be the only person that would, like, assume that he's in there. Quickly, you might wonder, how come no one's come for him after 23 hours? Well, Sand Cave resides on a 200-acre farm. There are several homes on this property with other families. One of them, of course, is Colin's house, where Floyd's father, Lee, resides. Now, right. Lee and Floyd constantly get into fights about how to run things. Lee wants his son to concentrate on farming, and Floyd wants to concentrate on cave tourism. Arguments would often get heated. And Lee was also a bit of a drunk. It was doubtful that he would even notice if his son Floyd was missing. Also not helping things, Floyd regularly lodged at two other homes on the farm. So when he didn't return to one host, they would presume that he was staying with the other. And, even worse than that, he had recently spent 30 hours in a cave. So disappearing for this length of time wasn't seen as abnormal. Oh, this sucks. Regardless, around the 23-hour mark, a few locals started to suspect that, hey, something might be wrong, and they went to check up on him. And here, uh, okay. they spotted his jacket still hung up. Unusual. They went to Hey, I have a pro tip for everyone. If you're gonna go somewhere by yourself, um, uh, in like the fucking wilderness or like any fucking anywhere, fucking tell somebody. Tell anyone. Tell anyone. Also, don't. But also tell someone. Deep. However, there was only one person small enough to make it as far as the turnaround room. This was a 17-year-old Jewel Estes. He refused to go into the squeeze, but it was close enough to call Collins' name. Floyd! And Collins yelled back. Yes, I'm here. 
Istis emerges from the cave. Oh, okay, we know he's trapped, and we know where he is. So, locals started to gather outside. Out of my way. Say a bunch of men who would each show up and take turns heading into the cave in an attempt to reach Collins. But once they reached the turnaround room... Nope. Nope. Yeah. Nope. They would fail to yeah. reach him, emerging from the cave, soaked in mud and cursing. Out of my way, they would say as they were Fuck heading that, in the I'm not doing reverse that. direction. So a few more hours passed, and word would spread around town. Dozens of locals from Cave City started to gather outside. Hey, listen, man, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I wouldn't do it. Over in Louisville, Floyd's 22-year-old brother, Homer, he Doesn't gets a phone call. Doesn't fucking help him uh, for me to fucking get I stuck see. and die. Ah, my brother. He's trapped in a cave? I'm on my way. Homer jumps on a coach and makes his way to Floyd's cave. Oh. Homer struts up to the scene. Dozens of men are standing around outside. He ignores them all and marches right into the cavern, still wearing his city clothes. He makes his way in, down the chute, through the narrowing passages, down on his hands and knees towards the turnaround room. And when he arrives, he does not hesitate. <gasps> he squeezes into the hole, scrambles his way through to the lake on rules. the other side. He sees Floyd below and slides down to meet him. Floyd! Sup? I probably wasn't that casual. Oh, thank God you're here. Homer took a moment to shine his light around the area and assess the situation. It was not good. No. This rock formation is going to prove almost impossible to work around. All right, so let's have a look. Floyd is here. The rock is here, pinning oh. his ankle. He's surrounded by rubble, and there's a Jesus pocket of gravel Christ. above him ready to fall. However, because this opening is so small, there are only two viable ways of reaching Floyd and that gravel. Option one, the most obvious, feet first. But if you do this, you have to kind of squat, and your own torso obstructs access to the rubble. Otherwise, option two, Oh come no, down fuck first. that. That will give you better access. Oh, but then but you get fucking stuck. Hundreds of pounds of gravel upside down. Worse yet, there's barely an inch around Collins on either side, so good luck getting your arm down near Floyd's ankle to actually free him from the wedged rock. Homer calls back to the less daring rescuers standing behind him. Quickly, some food and drink. They send it through. It's a good he start. He feeds his brother a pint of coffee and a total of nine sausage sandwiches. Fuck Feeling yeah, dude. Better? Much better. Then. Homer okay, to task. so he began removing we have mitigated the worst part, which is time. With the help of an old syrup can. For the next eight hours, he toiled, first with hands, then, once enough was cleared, using a crowbar to scoop behind his brother, scraping away sharp protrusions as he went. It was slow progress. I bet. Virtually futile. As soon as he removed one rock or scoop of gravel, another would tumble from above and land in the new absence. And it was exhausting work. I fucking By sunrise, bet. Homer's arms and back were knackered. His lungs burned. He was losing hope. Homer emerged hours later, shivering violently, skin bruised from his fingertips. But the cave barely yielded at all. However, Something new. How could you motherfuckers not have wanted outside, to watch this? This is like the best movie I've seen all year. Approximately 100 men and women. And it's fucking October. Around, drinking, squabbling, and talking big game about how they too were going to save Floyd. The press was also present to help people gawk from afar. Now, Homer recuperated at a small tent near the cave's mouth. Strangers immediately crowded around him to ask innocent, but frankly, Hey pussies, why don't you help me? And offer unsolicited, obvious advice, as well as wildly impractical solutions. He should try untying his shoes, said uh. Ah, no, we should send him down with a contortionist who's got a mallet and a chisel. Ah, we, we should jerk him off, right guys? Yeah, jerk him off. Yeah. Third guy up. But, yeah. yeah, the idea. And they started to argue with each other about their plans. Hey, how about using dynamite? One click formed, insisting okay. that it was- Hold on. Auto captions are gone. 
All right, I made that third guy up. Sorry, but guys. You get the idea. He's Australian. You'll figure it out. They to argue with each other about their plans. Hey, how about using dynamite? One click formed, insisting that it was a great idea. And another saying, no, 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 the explosion will kill him, and the weight of the new rocks will surely crush him. They fought for a while until yeah, they dynamite be a bad idea. about gas I, I, tortures, I'm pretty which will cook him that. or asphyxiate him, or the gas will poison him. But by far the most common suggestion, of course, was amputation. Never mind that the foot itself was unreachable, yeah, and never mind what the blood loss and shock would do to Floyd's weakened body, and never minding even more that Floyd was strongly reluctant to the idea. Mm. Whatever, Whatever you do, don't, don't cut, cut my, my foot off. <laughs> All of the squabble would not have gotten on Homer's nerves, except that not one of them would just brave the damn cave and continue shoveling away the gravel. The yeah. formula was always the same. Brave heroes go in with food and supplies, then reach the turnaround room and immediately lose their nerve, then dump the food just outside the hole, and then return back outside and go, oh, absolutely. No, he says, thanks for the food. Thank you so much. Yum, yum. No one would go through that squeeze. Fuck. Dozens more men would try. All of them. This is would awful. Fail. See, I would be brave enough to admit that I'm not even going to try. February 2nd, 9 a.m. That's my so truth. Far, Homer has been the only person to have reached Floyd. And that would continue to be true until... Here we are at the Louisville Courier. There's a spirited young newshawk named William Miller. He's talking to his boss, and he's trying to convince him that it's a great idea for him to cover the story of the man trapped in the cave. Listen up, boss. I'm hearing talk of a man in a cave. He's stuck down there, and I want to get down there, too. Get to the nitty-gritty, you hear? This is an opportunity for some good PR, Miller. I'm in. But I want us to sponsor that rescue. Picture this. Man saved from cave by Louisville Courier, the finest newspaper in the state. That'll drum up plenty of business. 24 carat idea, boss. I'll make it happen. I'll get down there too sweet. So off Miller goes to Floyd's cave. Back over at the cave, Homer is sitting outside trying to recuperate as Miller wanders up. He glares at the man in his city clothes and answers every question with either a grunt or a one word answer. Eh, yeah, sure. Finally, he gestures to Sand Cave. You want to get in the Listen, fucking cave, you bitch? you want more information? The hole's right behind me. Why don't you go take a look yourself? Now, Miller is only 21, but he is a slender and determined man. He takes on the challenge. So he removes his suit, drapes himself in coveralls, and grabs a lamp. All right. Miller slowly enters the cave. He finds himself stepping in puddles and having to correct his balance against the ever-softening walls. These were accumulating problems thanks to the gawkers outside who had lit campfires all around the entrance. Oh my fucking god. That caused snowmelt, and the stable environment of the cave is starting to shift. But Miller makes it further I than most. fucking can't. And all that's left is that final squeeze, and he's there. He stops. He takes a moment and just Okay, so I'm gonna assume that everybody in here can fucking pull their head out of their ass for a second. If you see an accident, uh, a medical emergency, a natural disaster, and people are actively engaging and helping, fucking leave. Fucking just leave. Do not get in their fucking way. Fuck off. At at best, call for call for help. Call for nine one one. Call for whatever. Right. Decides to call out to Floyd. fucking rubberneckers, Floyd! fucking making it so that Hearing people can't get the ambulances. Side, it's, it's the he feels oh, ashamed God. not to try, so he closes his eyes and moves forward. His slender figure begins inching through. The crystal gypsum cuts into his elbows and tugs at his clothes. He gets snagged. He's spluttering through the pools of muddy water. He stops, collects himself, and pushes on. He can barely inhale. If he gets stuck in here, he can only hope that someone else can come in from behind and pull him out by the legs. But eventually, he makes it through. Fantastic. He's now standing on the edge of a 10-foot pit, and he clumsily bumbles his way down. No. He sat right next to Floyd, ready to interview him. Really? But Floyd didn't really answer any of his questions. In fact, 
He was incoherent. I want to leave the At cave. The moment, he is sitting in a pool of water that is 12 degrees, slowly sapping his body temperature. He is dying from exposure. I would like to leave the, the cave. Is that is my answer to your interview. And he can barely make sentences. So Miller took a few mental notes and he left. He worked his way back through the squeeze, past the turnaround room and out into the daylight. He is covered in mud and scratches and numb head to toe. And when Homer saw, <gasps> his hope reignited. Someone else had made it to Floyd. You and me. Together, we can get Floyd out of there. Yep. If Miller hadn't gone to that cave, there's a good chance that Floyd's story would have remained an obscure footnote in the back pages. But the interviews and first-person accounts gave the audience a glimpse of something real. Fear, hope, desperation, the full range. And so from Los Angeles to New York, Floyd's story was picked up everywhere and described the Kentucky man's plight in sensational detail. It was also the era when radio became a regular feature for regular Americans. Mm. Radio allowed something new, hourly updates, letting people get engrossed into the story. So, mostly thanks to Miller, the story of Floyd over the next week would grow and grow seemingly frothing over into every aspect of American life. The press at large would be clamoring over each other for every little extra scrap of detail they could get about Floyd. And everybody wanted to know, will this man make it? Back outside the cave, someone new enters the scene. All right. Lieutenant Robert Burden. Oh, a finally. strong 33-year-old Louisville firefighter. A fucking like professional. Miller, he was able to navigate the passages of the cave and brave the squeeze. Dude, Scratched firefighting before the advent of, like, a fucking water, fire truck must have been the through. absolute most lethal shit in the he world. He grabbed the rope and confidently lowered himself to Floyd's position. <laughs> it was not an optimistic sight. Floyd's condition was deteriorating. Well, we've got a heck of a problem here, but I think I can get you out with a rope. Floyd nods in approval. Go on. We might just pull your bloody leg off. Just pull my leg off then. Get me out of here. Burden returned to the surface and faced the crowd. Yeah. He announced. We will attempt a rope pull. The crowd moved. It was dangerous. Yeah, it no shit. It would certainly break his foot and could altogether pull it off. If there are jagged rocks, you'll fill it, the poor man. Amongst the crowd, a doctor stepped forward. A rope pull could stretch his internal organs and cause them to rupture. You'll kill him. But Floyd is dying of exposure down there. Yeah, no, he's the gonna be dead either way, man. Desperate. Burden put caution to the side. The time for strategy is over. Now we try brute force. Will you wrap it around his armpits? that oh okay After 79 hours in the cold water, Jesus he is delirious, shit. fading in and out of consciousness. Homer gave his brother some coffee and fed him a couple of ham sandwiches. That warms yeah, him up and gives him a bit more energy, and he comes ham. back to lucidity. Oh, much better. I'm gonna put the special harness around you. Burden and Miller, they're here too. We got three more boys right up the cave, and they're all ready to pull as hard as they can to get you out of here. Floyd was frightened. I'm not gonna lie, it's gonna hurt. He gave yeah, his brother gonna, some whiskey yeah. and a strong sedative to it's calm be his nerves. Bad. And also to help him withstand the shock in case his foot is destroyed. It's gonna Floyd be... took the opportunity to appreciate being surrounded by friends and family. Go on, do it. All right, strap him up. Homer tied the harness around Colin's chest and knotted the rope. Ready? So Tessa says, just Miller cut his leg off. They the can't, there's no way to reach Ready. his leg. Burden clenches the cord from further up the cave. Three, 
The rope goes taut. Two. Do it. One. Oh. Instinctively, Floyd gasps. The force of six men pulled against the clutches of the cave. Floyd began to scream. His body was being pulled up from the rubble. The gravel was beginning to shift. Burden clenched his teeth. Oh, harder! Floyd screamed harder as well. Now, Floyd was trapped in a supine position. Right. But the direction of the rope caused an upwards force that wrenched him vertically. His torso was being compressed and bent against the ceiling of the trap. It would kill him. Floyd's screaming intensified, and through gasps was begging them to stop. The screams filled the echoing cave, but it did not stop. The agony continued, on and on, with no progress. Enough! Enough! You guys are killing him! Homer pulled in the opposite stop. direction to give his brother some reprieve. Somehow, Homer mustered the strength to altogether wrench the cord from the other men's hands. The rope went slack. Jeez, Homer, Homer, Floyd, and the rope lay limp on the cave floor, panting and exhausted. No progress had been made. The cave would not let this man go. The futility of the situation sank in, and all they could do was leave for now and reassess. Everybody was shaken by the experience. Burden fainted as he crawled towards the exit. Most of the other men had to be carried away. Outside, the crowd had grown to 200. They buzzed and asked useless questions, and Homer walked dejectedly past them. Jesus he sat Christ. by thinking what he could do. The cause seemed hopeless. Homer? Then, someone showed up who could turn things around. He looked up to see a childhood friend of both his and Floyd's, Johnny Gerald. Hey, Johnny. Gerald knew more about cave rescues than most. Really? In fact, just that summer prior, he had helped untangle Floyd from a different snag. He was just the man for the job. All right, let me go see him. Well, look who it is. Floyd perked up immediately. Yay. Thrilled to see <laughs> Gerald. All right, let's see what we can do. Gerald jumped down. For the next three hours, Gerald went back to the original plan of prying away rocks. His stamina was good, and progress was surprisingly good as well. For several more hours, he continued, just moving stone after stone. New one would fall in his place, and he'd move that one too. By midnight, he had enough room to shift position and clear some of the gravel that was at each side of Floyd's body. Gerald would spend several more hours scooping. And it worked. For the first time, Floyd's torso was now available. Then his hips, his upper thigh. For the first time in over 90 hours, Floyd was able to wiggle his arms, his hips, and even that trapped right leg, though it was very painful to do. Yeah. In that one session, Gerald managed to move a half ton of rock, but there was still a lot more to go. And that rock by his foot was still holding him in place. Damn, boy! At 2 a.m., Gerald was spent. He needed rest, and he was ready to head back outside. Floyd, tomorrow, you're gonna be a free man. Now, here you might think that things will become straightforward. No. They did not. Now that that space had been cleared, Burden became convinced that if he could get down that passage again, he could free Floyd with another rope pull, fate deciding with both feet or just one. But when Burden tried to enter the cave again, he was sternly rebuffed by the locals. They were playing gatekeeper. They had been specifically instructed to not let anyone in, and they were especially opposed to Burden making another rope pull after word spread about the disaster of the first attempt. He tried to reason with them. Let me try the rope pull again. It'll work this time. They wouldn't let up. Instead, they shouted obscenities and shoved him in the other direction. Hey, finally, they're doing something that matters. Meanwhile, Gerald and Homer are incapacitated with exhaustion, and Miller was busy filing some paperwork for the Louisville Courier. Nobody else had the ability or the authority to take action, so Floyd spent all of that morning alone. Hello? Hello? Is anyone, Is anyone there? there? Help. Help! Hey! Anyone out there? Word spread about Floyd. Miller's reporting had been picked up by the AP Newswire, and they distributed it amongst their hundreds of partnered newspapers. 
For Miller, it would be the biggest moment of his career. Yeah, no shit. But he didn't Damn. stop to pay it mind. He spent the day hatching a rescue plan. No, Miller. Miller descended into the cave and set to work. When he entered, he found that the team before him had strung light bulbs all through the cavern. Oh. Leading all the way down to Floyd. Well, that, that fucking rules. A bulb was also put around Floyd's neck to keep him warm and make sure that he was never again left in the dark. Miller popped down to Floyd. Ah, Floyd! Fancy seeing you here, buddy! Reusing that syrup tin, he started offloading gravel into buckets. Those buckets were then passed up and down the cavern. Oh, great! And so hey. it went on for the next two hours. Miller stopped for a break. He took some bread, milk, and whiskey. And sharing it with Floyd, they started to get to talking. Floyd had been in that cave for over 100 hours now. Oh, and seeing everyone working together, Floyd was overcome with a sense of hope and relief. And so he began spilling his heart out to Miller. Here is what he is quoted in the newspaper. I believed I would go to heaven. I can feel that I'm to be taken out alive and with both my feet. I kept thinking, what would happen if the rock above me would fall? It caused me to shudder. I kept thinking to drive my mind to something else, but it wasn't much use. I couldn't do much to help those who came to help me, but I knew that a lot of people were willing to do all in their power. It gave me courage. Tuesday morning, I thought to myself, four days down here and no nearer freedom than I was on the first day. How will it end? Will I get out? I couldn't think of it. I have faced death before. It doesn't frighten me, but it is so long. Tell them I am not going to give up. Tell them I am going to fight and be patient and never forget them. I don't like the way this feels. This feels Meanwhile, Floyd's story worrying. kept growing. Pedestrians would gather around corner store windows to read the latest bulletins. The press began using giant typefaces, commonly only reserved for declarations of war. Churches in all of the nearby counties were holding services for Floyd. Theatres even interrupted well, nice. their shows to update the audience. Now, at the time, President Coolidge was in charge, and his Secretary of Commerce was a geologist, Herbert Hoover. Now, Mr. Hoover followed Wait. the story very closely, and Is so it? it was likely that the president did Hoover, too. Hoover, the man who invented the Even FBI? Congress paused session to ask about the latest news from Sand Cave. By the end, the Floyd Collins incident would no, explode that's J. into Edgar the Hoover, my third bad. largest non-political story between World War I and World War II. Yeah, the Before news was pretty an packed of people to cave on those other Old years. population, 690. Yawn. New population, 10,000. Hotels ran out of food. Residents turned their homes into makeshift hotels, charging sizable premiums to let people nap in their bathtubs. The banks quickly ran out of on-hand cash, and 4,500 automobiles impatiently sat, backed up for two miles from 20 different states to drive onto the Collins farm and turn their pristine green pastures into swampy parking lots. Deep below all those tourists, there's Miller, trying to free Floyd. All right, a little bit of setup. Floyd, Miller, some remaining rubble, rock. For anyone to lift the rock by hand would be impossible because Floyd's body obstructs the hole. Miller grabs a crowbar and shoves it through the gap. Now he's going to lever it off Floyd's foot. Cool. The crowbar right. is now wedged against the rock. Next, he takes a jack. He no. positions it on top of the no, crowbar. No, I can already so that it will be see it. Against the ceiling. However, problem. That jack is too big. It doesn't fit. Miller yells up the tunnel for a smaller one, but this took some time. And when it arrived, too small, won't reach the ceiling. But instead of sending for another one, Miller takes two blocks of wood and bolsters them underneath the crowbar. I can literally right, so the crowbar already now see sits the higher, problem. It fulcrums against the blocks, and the jack is sitting on top. All Miller has to do is expand the jack, which he will do using this spanner, holding it at the very tips of his fingers. Sounds easy. It's not, but that's the plan. Let's get him out of there. He turned the wrench, the jack expanded, and the crowbar took strain. 
The whole thing slid apart with a pang. Floyd wasn't hurt, but Miller was contorting and exerting his whole body from back to fingertip. They tried again. Same result. Miller tried a new angle. Maybe this time. The jack pressed. The tension increased. And this time, the rock moved. It fucking moved. With each turn, the stone shifted a little more. Miller's hands shook with adrenaline, his face and body dripping with sweat. Pang. One of the blocks slipped, and the wooden tower went sideways. The rock painfully slammed back down on Colin's foot. Ah, you'll get it next time, Miller. Try again. Miller did. Again. And again. Adding blocks, taking them away, new crowbar position, changed the jack position, every angle, all while Floyd was there, cheering him on. Yay. <laughs> this isn't gonna work, man. For the next four hours, he tried. No progress. Miller was exhausted. He couldn't do this on his own, but he was the only one slim enough to get in through the gap. The group decided to concede for now and return to the surface. They would take just a small break, but it looked to everyone like there was a clear way to get this man out. So Miller and Burden crawl back through the mud and the winds of the cave. As they made their way through, the cave was visibly sagging. The ceiling seemed lower. Parts were harder to navigate than before, especially now with their bruised and purple hands. But they made it outside to the fresh early morning air. And here is where they're greeted with a new sight. Dozens of soldiers. The National Guard had arrived. In addition to the National Guard, a new figure was joining the story, Henry Carmichael. Now, Carmichael was the general superintendent of the Kentucky Rock Asphalt Company. He had been on site since Tuesday, and he was appalled at how primitive the rescue attempts had been. Okay. Shortly after Miller and co. had exited, Carmichael sent two men into Sand Cave to assess the structure's stability. So are these to be professionals? They soon came back with a report. It was not good. Near the final squeeze, large cracks had formed. The ceiling was beginning to droop. All right, so the following is a recounting of That's events not what I want to hear. from one of Carmichael's men, Casey Jones. <clears throat> Casey and another worker spent about an hour in the cave surveying its condition looking at the boards, the ceiling, the stability of the walls. He continued deeper towards Floyd. He was fighting against his nerves. The shifting of the rock pinged his every instinct to flee. But he heard Collins moaning ahead, so he pushed himself on. He managed to make it through the squeeze and he arrived at the 10-foot pit. Seeing Floyd trapped, he tried to ignore the pebbles that were tumbling behind him. Please, come down. Uh, I can't right now, Floyd, but I will when I get back. Behind Casey, his partner is begging to leave. Below Casey, Collins is pleading for help. Please, I'm so thirsty. Okay. Casey slid headfirst into the pit and hastily ladled Floyd some coffee. But Floyd rejected it. No, no. Rumbling intensified from above. And in that moment... Casey realized that this was not a plea for sustenance. Floyd knew that a cave-in was inevitable. Scared and approaching his fifth day trapped, he was completely at his wit's end. He knew he was about to be trapped in that cave, and he didn't want to be trapped alone. For God's sake, Casey, come on, you'll get us killed. Stay with me, please, don't leave. Casey looked into Colin's eyes, set the coffee down, and pulled himself out of the pit. He wiggled underneath the sagging ceiling and crawled towards the turnaround room as fast as his limbs could scramble against the cave walls. He looked back to see the passage closing like a maw. Reflections from the bulb shining around Floyd's neck were no longer visible. Instead, just sobs could be heard, muffled from behind the rocks. Miller and Burden awoke in the late morning, confident that today would be the day that they saved Floyd. They had some new equipment too. Some wire to wrap around the wooden blocks to prevent them from slipping. And they changed their mind about that acetylene torch. They'll use it to burn away two rocks that had previously blocked their way. 
But when Miller got to the turnaround room, all of that optimism left him. The entrance to the squeeze was now just a pile of debris. Miller froze, staring at it for a long while. Then he sighed and did the only thing he could think, attempt to move some of the stones. But each adjustment led to more rocks just tumbling down and landing in that space. He persisted until, crash. A large chunk of clay landed onto his feet. Recognizing the danger, Miller returned to the surface. 15 minutes later, oh, he emerged it. from the cave with a bloodied up nose and bruises down his back and shoulders. Burden caught sight and races over to him. Miller just says, for God's sake, just don't let Homer or anyone else back in there. Now, he didn't actually need to worry about Homer going back in there because he was sidelined with illness. But he did, however, need to worry about Gerald because he was furious. Gerald had I warned bet. everyone that putting dozens of people in Sand Cave would cause a collapse. It certainly did. The rest of that day would be wasted as men threw blame around and screamed at each other about how to handle the cave-in. And Floyd spent the rest of that day alone. I'm a little shocked that this isn't just the wrap-up of his death. The surveyors continued checking the cave throughout the day. By the evening, Carmichael had ordered everyone to an assembly. Gerald took the floor. He was going to try one last daring rescue. He boldly announced his plan and an ultimatum. Listen up, there's death down there. The walls and ceilings are crumbling. Unless you're determined to take the biggest chance you ever took in your life, tell me now and stay outside. Next, they told all the Gorkas to get the fuck out of the cave, clear off. And over the next eight hours, Gerald would enter and leave Sand Cave at least five times, chipping away at that pile of debris. In the woods, men sawed trees and chopped logs to shore up the cave walls. Okay. Underground, the crew reinforced cracks and wobbling boulders with fresh strips of wood. Okay. Gerald assessed that about four barrels of rocks would need to be moved, and piece by piece, they made that happen. Steadily, they managed to move enough rock to allow Gerald to get within earshot of Floyd. Hey. Hello. I need food. Bad news. We can't reach you. But hold on. We're coming. Stone by stone, they continued. After a few hours, the light of the bulb around Floyd's neck was peeking through. A couple more hours, enough room for Gerald to squeeze through. Okay, that's enough. Floyd, I'm going for now, but when I get back, I'm gonna get you out of there. Exhausted but still determined, Gerald crawled back up the cave and marched to the men huddling outside. Gather the equipment, and in an hour's time, it's gonna be me and Floyd coming out of that cave. Damn, bitch! Gerald entered Sand Cave for his final You got the huge time. balls! The walls had been reinforced, but mud and water was accumulating everywhere. He waded through it and pressed on past the danger of the sagging ceiling. With determination on his face and a grease gun clutched in his right hand, he scrambled towards Floyd. But before the final squeeze, he stopped. It was all gone. The cave ceiling had crumbled once again. Gerald stared motionlessly at the pile. Then he began to yell. Floyd! A rock disconnected from the ceiling and tumbled onto Gerald's head. Luckily, just a small one. He rubbed his scalp and called out again. Floyd! This time, a moan. It rumbled from the other side. Fearing that his friend was slipping out of consciousness, Gerald willed himself against the cave, launching the debris behind him with force. He ignored the pain from being struck on the head and clawed at the stone pile. He carried on this way for several minutes until a sharp, heavy rock dropped from the ceiling and landed squarely on his back. No more than 15 minutes later, Gerald returned to the surface, defeated. Only after the cave did they start to think about all of the things that they could have done. Wait, why didn't we rig a portable telephone line? That would have been incredibly simple here in 1925. Yeah, why have we been running in and out to deliver updates? 
Why didn't we give him an AM radio? He could have had something to listen to and receive messages of support from the public. Wait, why don't we rig up a tarpaulin so we could lift his torso up so he wouldn't be slowly dying of exposure? Oh god, why didn't we run a feeding tube? That's also a technology we have in 1925. All too late. Now what? The one route to get to Floyd is closed forever. That meant two options. Number one, capitulation. Surrender him to the cave. Oh, fuck that. Well, number two, dig down from directly above Floyd. Now, the prospect of digging from above seemed almost fanciful. At least it did in the beginning. But luckily, they had some help. Owing to Miller's reporting, Floyd had become practically the most famous person in the country. The rescue had become a high priority for the governor of Kentucky. Lieutenant General Denhart enters the scene. He's been updated on the situation, and following shortly behind him is a small army of miners and engineers. He declared to the despondent crowd, Gentlemen, I am here on behalf of the governor. The purse strings of Kentucky are open. Take this blank check and bring that man out alive. Floyd in that cold, wet confine could not have imagined the scale of the operation that was going on 55 feet above him. Authorities assumed control of Collins' rescue. Denhart gave Henry Carmichael the lead to dig, and Carmichael raced to get to work. He enlisted his employees, his fleet of expensive high-tech machinery. Professional groups were brought in from all across the state. Local townspeople were mostly excluded. And for the first time since Collins had been trapped, work was now about to go ahead in a systematic manner. Everyone knew the plan, everyone had something to do, and everyone was working fast. But just as hopes were rising, they were once again dashed against the rocks. They had all of this state-of-the-art machinery shipped in and assembled by the engineers and rearing to go. But you need the spot. And it was spot. all worthless. See, the problem is the cave drew air into it. These diesel-powered engines pumped out enormous volumes of choking exhaust. Within a day's operation, the cave would be filled with carbon monoxide and Floyd would be dead from asphyxiation. Just as quickly as solutions would arise, the cave would parry them away. It refused to let this man go. So engineers and miners had wasted hours assembling everything only to realize that they had to pack it all up and cart it away because the digging of a 55-foot shaft would be done with picks and shovels. Good old-fashioned manpower. Carmichael didn't know much about caves, but he knew a lot about quarrying, and he estimated that his team of 75 volunteers could dig and dredge at a rate of two feet per hour. That feels pretty if fast. They around the clock, they would be digging directly into the spot where Floyd lays within 30 hours. Now, was it possible that Floyd could survive for another 30 hours? Absolutely. Let's go. The first ton was moved, and at first it was easy work. Just dirt and clay. Carmichael understood well that this was a race against time, so he watched the men closely, and if they seemed to be slowing down, even a little, they would be Is the VOD going to be uploaded? Uh, the VOD's going to stay on something. Twitch where you can just watch it at your leisure the pace as slowed. a highlight. By 10 feet, the shaft narrowed greatly, which meant that only two men could work at a time. At 15 feet, they hit boulders. Oops. Pickaxes went in, and a system of pulleys and buckets had to be used to cart the rock out. Tracks were even laid to ferry the refuse to a dump site. Time passed. Hours passed. Night went to day. The day was hot. This was yet another problem, because it's early February, there's tons of ice still in the ground, and its exposure to the fresh midday sun meant that the walls of the shaft were softening and the ground becoming sodden. The pace of digging slowed. 
it was now only half a foot per hour. Oh my God. Most anyone God. could do was watch helplessly on the sidelines and pray. Interestingly, though, there were a lot of people on the sidelines. Floyd wouldn't have believed that the space above him had turned into a literal carnival in his honor. Vendors showed up to sell hamburgers, hot dogs, and souvenirs. Families sprawled out over blankets to listen to hymns from local church groups. The local mountebanks sold moonshine and miracle cures. There was even a bloody juggler. And old man Lee was there, walking around, shaking his jar, and soliciting donations. Ugh. But where were Homer and Burden and Miller during all of this? Okay, let's back up a bit. People did not properly understand exactly how Floyd was trapped, and the news didn't help much either. So the obvious question started to arise. Why hasn't he been rescued yet? Just clear some gravel or pull a rope. How is this so hard? Motive was attributed. I heard they didn't even want to have him rescued at all. I heard that they're doing all of this for publicity. His activity of soliciting donations, remember from before, further inflamed rumours. I bet Floyd isn't even trapped in there. These were all real rumours, and they got worse. You know what? I've heard he comes out at night, and then he just goes back in in the morning. Other rumours included... I heard that after Floyd went into the cave, someone murdered him. Others said... I think they're withholding food and water from him, so he dies. This whole thing is a fraud. As time went on, it was harder and harder to ignore the hoax claims. Then, people started to form righteous mobs, claiming the whole thing was a fraud, and they started to get nasty. In fact, two people even went to the telegraph office and pretended to be Floyd sending telegrams to his mother. Here's what it said. Quote, Please contradict statements that I am buried alive in Sand Cave. Stop. Tell mother I am all right. Stop. Am coming home. Stop. Floyd Collins. Naturally, the AP published these telegrams unquestioningly. Jesus and now word is out Christ. to the press that he isn't actually in the cave after all. That made the authorities Hundred years, look foolish, the same fucking shit and it as could today. Not go on. So, a hasty court martial was arranged, and Homer, Miller, and Gerald were summoned. They hold one session on Monday and another on Tuesday. Lee and everyone else is cleared of charges. A retraction is written and things carry on. Oh, the court martial worked. Generators rumbled. Pumps churned out water. Men continued working in shifts and carrying away the earth. Here they are with strips of lumber to shore up the walls. They were only 25 feet down. The pace had slowed to four inches per hour. In their desperation, they resorted to dynamite. No! But this did little to the boulders. Despite all these bleak circumstances, people's spirits were high because everyone was keen for their turn to dig. And because they had one more thing to latch onto. He is probably still alive. Now, how do they know that? Okay, so remember that light bulb around Floyd's neck? Right. Well, it's powered by a simple copper wire. Bare copper wire is subject to very minute fluctuations in resistance. So, an engineer rigs up a radio amplifier to this wire to read the current and see those small fluctuations. There they were. About 20 per minute. The rate Holy of shit. steady breathing. As his chest expands and contracts, they can read it from this device. And so... That's so going. fucking crazy. Unless it's the drip of the water. And going. And going. 30 hours was the original estimate. Now 144 hours had come and gone, and they were only at 44 feet. Then, rain fell. Rain that mixed with dirt to make mud, much of which then froze to make ice. Ice which expanded and damaged the integrity of the shaft walls. Slowing down with every hour, they continued. Many more hours passed and they were getting close. But it was now 15 days since Floyd was first stuck in that cave and people had mostly lost hope. 
That excitement in the newspapers was tempering down. Visitors began clearing out from Cave City. Many still held on to hope, but their final lifeline, that light bulb, had burnt out. And it wasn't possible to do any more readings on the radio amplifier without it. No one knew if Floyd you was still alive. You can't go this far and then give up now when he could be alive. Another 51 hours would pass before, finally, they reached the 60-foot depth. I'm in! Chisel! A chisel is handed down. At 1.30 p.m. on Monday, February 16th, Sand Cave would open once again. For 17 days, Floyd had been trapped underground, stuck in the same position. Four days without heat or light. Twelve without food or water. But maybe the dripping of the cave water had provided him with some sustenance? There are stories of people surviving harsher extremes. Rescuers frantically tugged at rocks to widen the hole. Everybody stood by, absolutely silent, peering into that hole. Id flashed his light into the gap, then eased himself in. Brenner aimed his light around the room, and then, finally, at Floyd. The first thing he saw was a golden shimmer. It was not the light bulb. It was the reflection of Floyd's tooth. His mouth hung open. He was dead. Brenner was helped out of the cave and he delivered the news. Dead. A coroner would later state that Floyd succumbed to exposure and yeah. that they had missed him by just three days about the same time that the light bulb had gone out. And that sucks. That's a bad way to go. But what would they do now with the body? The shaft walls were ready to fall inwards, and risking lives to remove a corpse was seen as just irresponsible. So the following yeah. morning, officials made a decision. Floyd would be entombed where he lay. The cave would keep its victim. But now what you're going to do is well you're going to seal family. the cave. But what could they do? The next day, they planned the funeral. The town emptied of people. And the shaft with Floyd at the bottom was refilled with soil. But that's not quite the end of the story. But if you hung on for this long, keep holding on. Because things are going to continue to get interesting. But first, let me do a wrap-up of where Destroy everyone is and all that the stuff. Cave. Context, context. The Collins family already had financial hardship. Locals saw old man Lee scouring the rescue site for glass bottles. But the owner of the land, B. Doyle, and supposed friend of Floyd, was wholly unsympathetic. He erected a sign on the highway which said, 200 yards away, the body of Floyd Collins is imprisoned in Sand Cave. Then, he began charging tourists 50 cents apiece for the opportunity to gander into the hole. It's 100 years later, B's dead. Let's call it even. Also, remember those claims of Kentucky being an open purse? Well, the state reneged on the deal. They refused to pay many of the rescuers, There's and most of them Kentucky. went home without any compensation. Some of them did make some money out of the situation, though. They lucked into vaudeville gigs and roamed the country, giving their first-person account. Miller, however, received an astonishing offer, a $50,000 contract from the Chautauqua Lecture Circuit, equivalent to the better part of a million dollars in today's money. He declined. He continued to work at the Louisville Courier Journal. The following year, his coverage of Floyd's story earned him the Pulitzer Prize. Now, the brother, Homer, he needed money and he agreed to do that vaudeville circuit. He stood on stage and regaled the audience about tales of his brother, their childhood, and the tragedy. But Homer made it known why he was up here on stage trying to get money. He had a mission. I kept thinking of Floyd lying in the muck, where he had suffered beyond our power to imagine. I would never have peace of mind if he remained there. He wanted the money to dig Floyd up and get him out of that cave. That's irresponsible. A months later, he had it. You would yeah, put right. people's so lives at risk. April 17th, 1925. Seven miners showed up to the scene. 
they began to dig. Within a week, they had arrived at Floyd. And this time, they approached from the other side of the rock formation. That way, they could remove the rock pinning Floyd's leg. They lifted him up from his tomb and laid him down on the fresh air above. Wow. April 26, they actually just went and did it? Floyd was set to rest in the family cemetery. A stalagmite had been set as a headstone to mark out his plot. And there he lay. For no, that's not actually where it ends. Okay, this is where it gets weird. Two years later, 1927, times had been tough for the Collins. So Floyd's dad sold Sand Cave to a dentist named Dr. Harry B. Thomas for $10,000. Damn. Now, Homer begged him not to, because at the time, the government was starting to buy up tons of land in the area and turn it into national parks. They had to pay at a very competitive rate. But Lee was becoming a bit old and senile by this point. And frankly, it's doubtful that he cared about Homer or Floyd or anyone else for that matter. It's 100 years later, he's dead now. Let's call it even. So the point is, in this land sale with Thomas, Lee agreed to a very odd clause. And that clause said, everything on that property belongs to Thomas. And should he wish, for example, to exhume a dead body and re-embalm it and put it on display in something really tacky like a, I don't know, a glass coffin inside a cave, maybe, then that would be his prerogative. Lee signed yes. And Thomas did exactly that. Doyle made Floyd's corpse a tourist attraction. That's right. Two bits of gander, come and wonder at the incredible dead man who died in a cave. But to add insult to injury, it worked. Visitors returned to Sand Cave to gawk morbidly at Floyd. Within a few months, Thomas had turned Lee's failing farm into a successful business. Now the rest of Colin's family is horrified. Yeah, they no tried shit. a number of times to get Floyd returned to them, including through the legal system. But somehow, incredibly, the judge ruled in Thomas's favor. And so, there he lay for the next two years. The cave was not done with Floyd. Until... Someone hatched up lamb. Two years later, it's midnight, outside Sand Cave. Footsteps can be heard rustling through the brush. Now, we don't know who these two men are, but we know why they are here. To rob a grave. They sneak inside and clamor over the rocks in the darkness. Reaching Floyd's casket, they undo the latch and throw open the lid. There is his shriveled body. They throw him in a gunny sack and they race off into the night. For 800 yards, they carry dear Floyd like a couple of sweaty Santas about to deliver a really terrible Christmas present. Panting, out of breath, knowing that they're going to get caught any minute, they reach the Kentucky Green River hillside. There's no time. With a one, two, three, they launch his body towards the river, and Floyd goes sailing into the air, up, up, into the starlit beyond. And landing in a bush. Oh, God. <laughs> the two men flee from the scene. Now, the next morning, Thomas notices that the body of Floyd is somewhat missing, and he contacts the authorities. The police come, they dust the casket for fingerprints, and bloodhounds are given Floyd's scent and let loose into the hillside. A few hours later, they manage to find him, a tangled up mess near the river. But this time, with a leg missing, that same one that was trapped under the rock. So, despite his protest, it had been amputated. Neither the leg nor the culprits were ever found. And while it would be nice to think that this was some well-intentioned duo that did this out of the kindness of their hearts to free Floyd, it's much more likely that it was an act of vandalism because Floyd was simply too much of a hot tourist attraction. The following day, Floyd was passed back into the cave, back into his box, and it was covered by a metal lid, surrounded by a metal chain, and locked with a padlock. 
he was now more trapped than he had ever been. This cave had spun fate once again to make sure that its victim would never leave. And so, Why? time passed. Floyd's body would continue to decay. The rot from his body would eventually rot the casket too, and every decade or so, it would need to be replaced. A few years later, he was no longer on display, but even then, he remained in that box for many more years. In 1961, Floyd's Cave was purchased by Mammoth Cave National Park, and it was closed to the public. There would be no more visitors. The entrance itself to Floyd's Cave was closed with a steel gate and Good. bolted, then welded shut. Good. But the Collins family never gave up objecting to Collins' body being left in the cave. And here is where the story ends. In 1989, at the Collins' request, the National Park Service ventured into Floyd's Cave. Continuing on a more than 60-year tradition, a team of people worked over the course of several days to remove him from the cave. They took him out, left the cave, locked it behind them, and laid Floyd to rest at the Mammoth Cave Baptist Church Cemetery. Jesus Christ. After 64 years in Sand Cave, he is now finally at peace. The end. Thank you to Wendigo. You should have just blown the cave If up. you don't let me out, I'm going to hire a gang of hitmen to come to your house and kill your family. Samito as Homer. The BTS meal McDonald's bag that has I'm McDonald's hungry. BTS. Shut the fuck up and eat some BTS, bro. Ordinary things as Miller. I'm enthusiastic, but would ultimately duck out the back exit. Rusty Cage as Gerald. Oh, well, hello there. Haven't seen y'all in a while. Welcome to my new home. And many kudos as Burden. Hey, hey buddy. You right down there? I can. You uh, sleepy? I can, huh? I can, yeah. We get your coffee? Cold and little cup, little cup of joe? That was pretty rough. Little cup of joseph? I yeah, now that's a pretty long video. Also, that was pretty way, incredible. Confused about the channels, so before we move on, we should probably now. watch one more video. Um, Oi, what's that look for? <laughs> Don't just stare at me. It's creepy. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't do it. I can't do it, it's too strong. I can't st oh my god. I couldn't figure out what it was gonna be. I couldn't figure it out. But then it was j it was j it was just Shulk yelling. That's all it was. Oh I hope everybody enjoyed the stream today. You literally saw it last time? I fucking forgot! What are you gonna do about it? I gotta fucking... So the plan for tomorrow, by the way, was to play Plague Tale. I'm gonna have to move that because I need to play up till where I was on the console version. Uh, I will replace it with something else that is cool. Uh, and then maybe we will play that on Sunday, uh, Saturday, or maybe next week. Just play it again. You realize the console's locked to 30, right? Yeah, but console 30 is almost always way better than PC 30. Also, I got them to give me a code, so I might as well just fucking write. Why not? What happened to Shooters? Oh, Shooters, I'm not going to play for long. I just want to see what it's like. All right, let's thank the people. For example, I want to thank Jed Ward for kicking in five subs and Spritz for gifting ten. Oinky, 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 oinky. oinky. I'm a little piggy. Oink, oink, oink. Rawr. Why is console 30 better? Frame pacing? That and frame limiting. Uh, PC, a lot of PC games, uh, don't, uh, frame limit to 30 very well. 
Wait, it's over? I've been streaming for hours and hours, bro. Bruh. Bruh. Here at King Sports subset of Ray Reborn and Dawnstar. Thanks, guys. Like a whole two hours. I started at two o'clock. Go to hell. Love the shirt today. Thank you. Pat is intentionally sabotaging React Stream so he doesn't have to play Banjo Kazooie. I slam my penis in the car door. You slam your penis in the car door. Ah, uh, okay. I felt that would be appropriate. He slammed his penis in the car door. Super blah kicked in a sub. Want all the groceries in one bag, but don't want it to be heavy. I could fight everyone in the world who's ever said that. Tron kicked in five hundred bits. They call me the fraudster. I manipulate the votes. Don't do it, Tron. Dragonite Sage, Ronald McDownload, and Full Trust Taco sub. Thanks, guys. Dova Dude kicked in five bucks. Thanks, Dova Dude. I've been to Mammoth Caves with my pops a few times when I was young, and I can confirm, as cool of an experience as it was, it was also one of the most ominous and tense experiences I've ever had. Loose sense of time. Real easy down there. Scary. Yeah, I'm not doing it. Fuck that. I don't want it. Big Jam Jam's up. Thank you. Lorcan's left nut kicked in a thousand bits. Thanks, Lorcan. This shit reads like an SCP. It sure does. Biking Star kicked in a sub. Pat, I fucking love the stream. Never change. LOL. I will never stream. Sorry, I will never change. Aoko kicked in five bucks. Thanks, Aoko. When I was much younger, I went caving with some friends and family. I went through a tunnel which was 50 feet long and 14 inches wide as narrow as crawling through and pushing myself along with my fingertips and toes, inch by inch. Wow, you're a fucking idiot. Don't do that and don't tell me about it. Andrew of Bob sub. Thank you. Here's the sub to push the banzi banjo and kazooie play up. Yeah, it's not going to happen. You guys are dickheads. You'll never get banjo kazooie. I'm going to put that fucking thing and reset it every single fucking month just to watch you guys never reach it. And Grandma Mari kicked in a sub. Hi, Pat. Stares a cave base voter fraud and horrors beyond our imagination. I forgot what I was going to ask before. So instead, what was your thoughts on the performance of Dark Tide? It was trash. Uh, do you think it'll be worth buying at launch if you don't have a beefy boy PC? Impossible to tell now. Absolutely, completely impossible to tell. Optimization is the last thing that happens. That build was likely from like August or earlier. Impossible to tell. All right, that's it for me tonight, guys. I hope you all had a good day. I'm once again filled with piss. Drowning in piss inside my body. Like tons of piss. Raid Germa? How do I raid Germa? What's Germa? How do I Germa? Is that Germa? I don't think I've ever raided Germa. I'm a little nervous. What if he screws up my name? Much like, much like the mouse... And the Nyan did. Oh, all right, fuck it. Let's raid the Germa. Okay, the Germa time. All right, y'all have a good night. I'm out of here. Say hi to Germa for me. Have a good night. Bye. All right, this counts as Elden Ring, right? Probably. Yes. Wait, I thought he... No audio. Oh, fuck. I'm killing it out here. I'm fucking killing it. Hold on.
How about now? Fucking kill Did you me. know that the bats in Elden Ring can sing? I mean, no. Or at least no, I couldn't. Could I didn't know that. Once. In the network test files of Elden Ring is unused animation 702, which places the bats in this upright pose singing this mysterious song. <laughs> Yeah, this is the lazy shit right here. Right? When this was discovered, the question quickly became, what language is this? Because while it sounds distinctly Japanese, it's not. It's actually Ainu, a language that is considered to be critically endangered, with just 304 people within Japan able to understand the language to some extent. Yeah, they fucked over the Ainu so real bad. Even you hearing this is just such a rare sound, and while it might have always been nothing more than a placeholder song, I'm glad that we can all share in this song, called Heretun Rutun, and sung by the late Umeko Ando. The singing bat was unearthed by renowned modder Sekiro Dubi, and I highly recommend oh, their good old Sekiro Dubi. Links in the description, as always. If this song was always just intended to be a placeholder, then a silly it name. was intended to be a placeholder for the Song of Lament, which is a song in Latin that did make it into the final version of the game. Unlike other excerpts of Latin that feature in boss soundtracks in From Software games, this song, sung by the Harpies, is completely translatable, with lyrics that tell us a story. These Harpies are actually singing Alas, that land once blessed now has diminished. We, betrothed, destined to be mothers, now become tarnished. Latin's overused in video game music. You know why that we is, right, Cool tears, Mike? But it's no one it's old us. and it's dead. Golden one, at whom were you so angry? So that land is obviously a reference to the lands between. It also sounds ominous and as the shit. remaining lines are referring to the harpies themselves. Though they have now lost grace, they longed at one point for betrothal and motherhood. Their cries in the final line are for the Golden One, who could be Marika or the Greater Will that once blessed the lands between. The Harpies now wonder what they've done to deserve such a lamentable fate. Again, most of From Software's soundtracks use excerpts of Latin resulting in this untranslatable soundtrack language Good night, Chuck, as eh? confirmed by the composers themselves in the past. The Song of Lament is a clear exception, however, and it being written in actual Latin points to its significance. Special thanks to YouTuber and Latin student Antonius Tertius for their detailed and reliable breakdowns of Latin in From Software's games. So the Harpies not being able to be mothers is one thing, but if we go back to the network test of Elden Ring, we learn of other things that might stand in the way of reproduction in the lands between. Let's I remember talk this. about the old description of turtle neck meat. Originally, turtle neck meat was supposed to boost virility, but none in the it lands looks like between a dick. seem to have much appetite for it these days. In the lands between, the urge to reproduce has waned long ago. And while the description has since been changed, it does suggest that the urge for reproduction is long dead amongst all tarnished. Yeah, but the implication is that eternal life anyway. completely right. screws up the desire to reproduce. There is some evidence that birth is now handled by the Erd tree, but that discussion might have to wait for another video. So, for now, pickle your turtle neck meat and consider doing something more productive with that stamina boost. The tarnished can, after all, cook up some pretty good stuff in Elden Ring. Unlike me, uh, the next secret is I can't I can't cook unless it's with HelloFresh. So oh my God, it's HelloFresh, but Hello it's Fresh not my HelloFresh. So get the fuck out of here. Pre-prefs. Let's talk about Blackguard Big Bogart. Despite his title, Blackguard, he doesn't actually belong to any Blackguard company or order. He's not a professional knight or a guard of anything which fits his character, given how he accosts Raya and steals her necklace. But perhaps therein lies the answer. The name Blackguard is actually the word Blackguard in the Japanese version of the game, mm -hmm. which is another word for scoundrel, or one who uses foul language in front of a respectable woman, which... That would be me. I would be a blagger. Yeah, that tracks. Chat with him though, and this tough exterior begins to melt away. But we'll talk more about Bogart in the upcoming Prepare to Cry episode. Be a shame if anything were to happen to him, right? 
speaking of foreshadowing, Elden Ring foreshadows events right away. From oh, the dude, you just have terrible scaling in general and limited viability beyond luring enemies to you. You loot this talisman above the gatefront site of Grace. Actually, from here, we can just see Box hiding place, and I'd like to talk about him a little bit more since it's unlikely he will feature in oh, go any upcoming episodes. As we've mentioned before, armor alteration has a cost if you perform it at a site of grace, but it can be performed for free by Bok. And if you want to keep Bok around for the entire game, then it's important not to give him a larval tier when he Don't requests do it. one in Lane Dell. Doing do so it. will send him down an unfortunate, deadly path, a fate that is actually foreshadowed earlier in his questline. If given the larval tier, Bok will make his way to Renala where he'll be reborn in human form, but unable to speak. And if you reload the area, you'll then find him dead, curled up in a corner. This position is foreshadowed in one of the earliest conversations with Bok, where after reclaiming his sewing needle, he reminisces about his mother. My mum was a seamstress, and that sewing kit was all I had to remember her by. I always wanted to be just like sweet old mum. Suppose I... I can't just curl up and die, can I? The larval tear, unfortunately, doesn't have the same rebirthing effect on him as it does on you. The great rune of the unborn holds a warning of this as well, with its description reading, Children born anew by Renala are all frail and short-lived. So, when the time comes and he asks for a larval tear, Don't it's worth using let him. a prattling pate item instead to tell him how beautiful he is. You're beautiful. Thank you very much. Mum was always the only one who said I was beautiful. And now, my dear Lord, let me hear her voice. Do you feel the same way my mum did, my Lord? Do you think I'm beautiful, despite these looks? <laughs> oh, my Lord. My dear Lord. I, Bok the Seamster, am forever in your service. May the throne of Elden Lord be yours. Sometimes it's easy to overlook you these smaller items and the impact they can have on the world around you. The crystal darts are another example of this. In a previous video, we discussed how the Erd Tree burial watchdogs and imps short circuit when struck with them, attacking each other in the process. But did you know that the giant golems also experience this effect? They take a few more hits oh. than imps or burial watchdogs do, but they will turn on each other cool. just the same. Given the crystal darts description, which reads, a golem crafter employed a similar crystal tool, it appears that the giant golems have the same creator as the imps. Why are and people the so obsessed watchdogs. with these games? Because they're cool. Perhaps this golem crafter wanted an easy way That's to it. keep them all controlled. They're cool, man. And people could do like so cool stuff. through these darts. Morgoth's Cursed Sword is another interesting item. Its description reads, A cursed blood that Morgoth recanted and sealed away, reformed into this blade. It also has quite the introduction as Morgoth reveals its iridescent design by breaking the outer shell of his cane. However, this reveal has undergone a bit of a change in recent patches. Originally, in patch 1.02, this animation featured flames rippling through the cracks of his cane, which is a detail that suited him remarking how you're emboldened by the flame of ambition. But this has since been removed. As pointed Who do you out hope the DLC will be about? Reddit, since patch uh, I hope it'll be a time travel DLC and that we beat up America as the final boss and we away. get to hang out with younger this change is minor. But I don't think it's a bug. I think it's intentional. That's what I want. By removing the flame, it actually holds back the reveal of what this sword is capable of, which actually takes place in the second phase, not the first phase. Uh, its unique skill is Cursed Blood Slice, which leaves this bloody trail followed by a burst of flame. And taking away this foreshadowing gives this weapon a chance to show off what makes it special in the fight itself. This look of madness is one that's only seen in select locations in oh, Elden I love Ring, that shit. but it is easily recognizable through glowing flame-like eyes. You can even give your character these eyes by pursuing the Lord of Frenzy flame ending. 
and the moment you get these eyes is when you're embraced by the three fingers. Wait, I these eyes are those actually eyes. only one of three different variations that cool. you can give your character, though. Blood red eyes are another option that appear once Vare's quest line has been completed, and dragon eyes appear after purchasing four separate dragon communion incantations. Oh. If you find these aren't your style, or you remove them accidentally, you can enable or disable these eyes through the mirror in Fia's room. These eye colors just scratch the surface of cool. what Elden Ring offers in terms of customization. To help figure out players' favorites, Japanese magazine Famitsu conducted a survey with 1,700 Elden Ring players back in April. This covered everything from bosses to weapons to which locations were players' favorites. So despite the wide variety of weapon types available, Katanas won over 841 of these 1,700 players. That's almost half the Oops. votes. And it does make I'm sense considering how right coveted now. the Moonvale and Rivers of Blood are. And there's rarely been a bad Katana in a Souls game, after all. Greatswords came in close behind with 641 votes. For magic users, Comet Azur was a top choice of attack with 240 votes. Again, this makes sense with how unbeatable it can be when stacked with the right buffs. And you might be wondering which Spirit Ashes took the prize. Bloodhound it's not surprising set. to learn that the Mimic tier was at oh, the top and, of the list. Oh, Ashes, Black right. Black Knife right. Tish as well came in at a close second. As for bosses, Star Scourge Radan left the greatest impact on players with 687 votes, and perhaps unsurprisingly, Millennia came in just behind him at 658. As for endings, Rani's ending is by far people's favorite, and Caled and Limgrave came out on top in regards to areas, with 456 and 409 votes respectively. Really? But every location in Elden Ring contains hidden details, and even now I'm still noticing new things when I explore the world, just tucked away in a piece of map that I've somehow missed until now. A perfect example lies here, in a northwesterly area of the Altus Plateau. Here, that you might have noticed an unusual concentration of death-blighted creatures, as well as a minor Erd tree that is completely dead, with a small gathering at its base. The spread of this death blight is actually due to the location that lies beneath all of this, the deep root depths. It's here where Godwin, the Prince of Death, is rotting away. Slowly, his death root man, started the fact that he to turns make its into way a fish, man, through the so lands cool. between, which explains why creatures both above and below can be seen with his postules of death, especially the closer they are to Godwin's throne. It's these small details that really make Elden Ring's world and story, and these kind of details can also be plucked out of cutscenes. One Reddit user, credit to them, found one very important detail during Godfrey's cutscene. It's that there is actually a guidance of grace in this scene that is directing him towards you as his next objective. The most important detail in this scene actually ties into where this grace is coming from, Morgoth's body. As Godfrey sets him down and he dissolves, the guidance then points him to his next purpose, defeating you. For number 15, let's talk about Patches. I love Everyone you, Patches. knows by now that he disappears when summoned for the fight against Radan. It's funny, and it suits the cowardice inherent in his character, which was set up earlier when he begs for mercy against you. But did you know that you can later beg for mercy against him? No. If you attack Patches and he manages to lower your health to half, he tells you to grovel instead. Doing so grants you the extreme repentance gesture, and once performed, he says he'll forgive you and considers your transgression water under the bridge. This is quite a fun way to show that even though he's deceitful and insincere, Patches actually has Holy the ability shit, to be that. reasonable. It's also a moment where you can pick up another gesture, so don't miss it. One thing you might have missed is located here, at the Stargazer's ruins in the mountaintops of the Giants. Here, Aureliette is searching for her sister, Aurelia. Where no, I did, did that. Go? I did that. You promised me when we turn 14, we go to see the stars. I've been waiting ever so long. I did that. I'm cool. Forever and ever, it seems. And if you've spoken to Roderica, then Aurelia has actually been traveling with you this whole time. The spirit jellyfish Roderica gave you back then is Aurelia 
proven by her description, which also reads that she's a jellyfish prone to tears who is searching for her distant home. I'm so cool. I did this. I was the so two smart. Sees them setting off to see the stars, but the moment is made bittersweet by the truth of what actually happened to them. Of course, they're both spirits. And if you continue down the cliffside beyond the ruins, you'll find two small graves. It would seem that the sisters died young, with their one final wish being to see the stars. I'm not sure why they couldn't see the stars before this. Maybe they belonged to the Nox, who were banished down to the Eternal Cities, and they only just made their way up here. But regardless, thanks to you, it seems, they are finally able to be at peace. Another interesting character who can give you their spirit ashes is Latena, who right, then is an Eldenoric woman lady. who longs to return to the land of Mikola's Halig Tree. And interestingly, this spirit is actually able to mount other nearby direwolves in special circumstances, just like the other Albanoric wolfback archers in the game. User Neopie on Reddit that made is, this discovery, like showing how the tennis spirit ash can ride direwolves in both Carrier Manor and the consecrated snowfields. So not only does this allow her to move around much quicker, but she can also cast Freezing Mist while mounted. This is also a completely unique behavior to Latena. Uh, Kaiden spirits can't ride Kaiden horses, nor can Nox spirits ride giant ants, like their actual counterparts in-game can. According to Zuli the Witch, this might occur because the Albanoric archers can't move, so wolves have to be coded to go to them. Thus, the wolves actually are the ones with the ride request functions in their logic, but the Nox ants and the Kaiden horses do not have this by comparison. For number 18, did you know that Gostok is actually one of Elden Ring's sneakiest and most deceptive NPCs? I From the moment you meet him, this character is actually following you around Stormvale Castle unseen. And while he's doing this, he like is how he stealing like shits 30 his pants if you run the runes that you get in this area each time you die. But, lucky for you, there's a few ways to stop this rune tax from occurring. You can, of course, kill Gostok, which also nets you his bell bearing, but then you miss out on the ancient dragon smithing stone that he grants you at the end of his questline. If you'd prefer to stop him in a less permanent fashion, you can actually catch him stalking you around the castle. He you can it. find him following you here, at the very bottom floor below the door that needs the rusty key, here next to the rampart tower grace in the tower behind you, and here on the rooftop above where you first meet Roger. Talking to him in these locations puts an end to his meddling and ensures that you can keep all of your runes. Like, oh, Gostok oh, actually has oh, a couple oh. of aspects around him that are easy to overlook, like his missing hand, for example. The most likely explanation of this is that he was grafted in the past, considering how he's living in the home of Godric the Grafted, after all this would make sense, and his hatred of Godric points to this as well. It's clear that Gostok's no stranger to grafting, but there are moments where it sounds like he almost wants to do it to others. When following you around Stormvale, particularly at his second location, you'll find him crouched near a dead body saying, Another one, another one, all skin and bones. Worse than a petty squire. Ah, not a muscle on this one either. Once you begin talking to him, he'll explain that ah, he's just clearing out some corpses. And it could be that he's just looting these bodies, but the focus on this muscle is an interesting I detail. I love that he is this a shit. This can be pushed a bit further if you attack him early on and let him kill you. Don't worry. I've got big plans for what's left of you. Going back to Elden Ring's closed network test, it actually has a couple more interesting secrets within it that were sadly left on the cutting room floor so long ago. One very interesting thing involves Rani the Witch, who Sekiro Dubi was able to discover originally had a double voice to match her double face. What do you think of this voice really? creation? A pleasure to meet thee, Tarnished. I am the Witch Rena. I'd heard tell of a Tarnished hurtling about atop a spectral steed. Do you think this is better than Rani's regular voice, or is it too much? There were several other changes made between the closed network test and the full release, including an important change made to the description of the Daedicar's Woe talisman. In the final version the of Elden what? Ring, Daedicar's Woe describes a woman named Daedicar, 
who indulged in every form of adultery and wicked pleasure imaginable, giving birth to a myriad of grotesque children. Originally, though, Daedica was described as an entirely different character. Earlier text describes them as a soft-featured man who was one of Captain Rykard's paramours, as well as an attendant in his Inquisition. Considering this talisman is dropped by Raya, its current iteration befits her backstory as this poor unwanted offspring of a repellent birthing ritual per the serpent's amnion. Perhaps Raya was even one of these grotesque children the description mentions. Another minor change made to her yeah. character was the removal of Radan's pet cat, the long tail what? cat description found in version 1.0 of the game featured a description reading a brooch depicting a long tailed cat known to be the beloved pet of General Radan. It goes on to say that this black cat was known to have enjoyed jumping down from great heights. It would leap from the great bell that. tower of Raya Lucaria as a kitten and once fully grown from the great heavenswood roots that twisted through the Erd tree capital skies. Unfortunately, this description has been edited out for some reason, but even though official word of Radan's cat is kind of gone, this small detail helps to it's paint purple. this grander look up, picture look how purple of the is. Conqueror it's purple. of the stars. It's a purple Along with control. the love that he clearly has for his horse, it seems that before his life as an Elden Ring boss, he was simply an animal lover. Speaking of animals, there's a piece of Garank's storyline that's very easy to miss, after receiving a few death root, he lashes out at you, and after that, at some point, there's even a moment where you might catch him howling at the night sky outside. Or, perhaps, given his direction, maybe he's howling at the Erd Tree. Of course, Garank, or Malaketh, was Marika's shadow, and it's kind Didn't of heartbreaking to think that he's howling in her direction here, imprisoned as she is inside the Erd Tree. For number 24, let's talk about Sir Gideon Ofnir. During your battle with him, he utilizes a ton of spells and incantations, but have you ever wondered how he gets all these spells? Well, YouTuber Garden of Eyes explains that there's actually a default set of spells that Gideon has. Comet, Comet Azur, Carrion Phalanx, Black Flame Ritual, Triple Rings of Light, Law of Causality, and one open slot. This open spot is determined by whether or not you've killed Rikard, Melania, or Moog, the Lord of Blood, which are all optional bosses. And depending on which one of these that you've killed, Rikard's Rancor, Melania's Scarlet Aeonia, or Moog's Blood Boon can be placed in that open slot. If you've killed two of these bosses, then one of their abilities will replace Comet Azur, and killing all three will also replace Triple Rings of Light. And for our final secret, Gideon huh. isn't the only boss that relies on others for his attacks. One of the ancestral spirits also utilizes the smaller animal spirits that roam around the boss arena to mix up its attack patterns. As pointed out by Zully the Witch, the ancestral spirit will move through the room, bursting through different animals to restore health and obtain some of their characteristics. For example, if it absorbs a deer, then it gains an upwards antler thrust. Absorbing a boar grants it the ability of a ramming charge, while spring hares give it a jumping stomp, and the goats provide these rolling attacks. I love this detail, and so many of the details in this video. Well, that was a fun Thank video. Thank you so much for watching. Okay, bye-bye. We did it.